Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tingsev. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders in the hospitality and restaurant industry to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind that both employees and customers love and support. In this episode, I had the pleasure of having a great conversation with Rob Fink, founder and CEO of the Big Drop Brewing Company, a fast-growing low-alcohol beer company. Rob set up the Low Alcohol Beer Company after a long career as a solicitor in London City. We talked about his journey building the brew company, trends around low alcohol, leadership, state of the industry, and much more. So grab your beer and notebook and enjoy. Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast. Today I'm uh, sitting in Bermondsey with uh, Rob from uh, the Big Drop Brew Company. We're going to be talking about a theme that's very popular right now in the industry. There's no to low alcohol. So Rob, welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. And thank you for inviting us out here. So people that don't know about you, Rob, and uh, the business, can you just give it a bit of a, an overview about what journey you've been on and how you ended in a no to low alcohol beers sure no problem so for my sins i used to be a lawyer back in 2010 i started my own law firm with one other guy and the the general split was that he would do much of the legal work and and my role as well as doing a bit of lawyering was business development and the law firm was in the city of london and the networking culture is quite pub driven shall we say and so I would spend my mornings start work early doing legal work until lunchtime and then in the afternoon I would hit the pubs and that was that and I was generally in the pub for most if not all of the afternoon for most if not all of the week but then in 2014 my wife and I had our first son and so I stopped drinking alcohol completely for about six months just while he was a tiny little baby with a show of solidarity for my wife but but also because of course you can't come home after you've been in the pub all afternoon drinking many many beers and give your baby a bath and put him to bed and do all the other things that you do as a as a dad but of course because my job was largely business development in pubs I still had to be in the pub And you can't drink cola or lemonade or coffee all afternoon in a pub. You start to climb the walls or feel slightly peculiar. So I ended up drinking alcohol-free beer. So I'd buy a couple of bottles of of alcohol-free beer and pour it into a pint glass, and and that was what I drank. But it wasn't very good. And I suddenly realised one day, looking around, that I could buy all this amazing craft beer from all around the world, all different styles, pale ales and stout, IPAs and sours and anything else you wanted to buy. But if I wanted an alcohol-free beer, there was only one option, and the option wasn't very good. And so I thought, what if I could try and do for alcohol-free beer what craft beer had done for beer, which is to say, to make it good. That was the genesis of the idea behind Big Drop. And what happened then? Because one thing is the idea, and the next thing is executing on the idea. So we're sitting here in your office, and I can definitely see you you come a bit further in that journey than when you had that yeah, a that, we've, moment. We've, we've, we've done all right then since yeah. then. I quickly realized that I have absolutely no idea how you brew beer. That was the starter for 10. And I also realized that I have no idea about things like design or social media or, or anything else. So I spoke to an old school friend of mine, James, and ended up taking him with me as a, as a business partner. And we found a fantastic brewer who now works with us full time to develop our recipes and we found a little tiny brewery in Bermondsey, actually, funnily enough, not far from where we are now, that we could do small test brews in. And as it turns out, Johnny pretty much nailed it and has developed a, an amazing oh, it's, process it's pretty for, good, yeah. for, for, for producing this, this alcohol-free beer. So those were the first steps. And, and then it really went very quickly from there. We, we started out, the first beer was released November 2016. In January 2017, I think we sold the equivalent of about 600 pints of beer. So not very much beer at all. But then this January, just three years later, I think it's something like 100,000 pints of beer. So the growth has been pretty pretty exponential. Yeah. But that growth, that comes back to what I mentioned a bit in the beginning as well, this new trend on low and no alcohol. Because I know there's a couple of other small brew companies, yep. another company doing the same things, and, and, and I don't know what their growth is, but they're looking at, they are getting more and more visibility as well yeah. in the market. So And there's a demand for this. I can see it in my local bottle shop where I come in over Christmas. There was actually the, the two core shelves. Yeah, was with, with no and low alcohol yeah. because I live in an area with families, so you can't be drunk all Christmas. Yeah, as you said, you'll come home drunk. Yeah, 
to take care of kids. Absolutely. I think we were certainly lucky in, in one respect in as much as that, that trend started to take off at the time that we released our first beers, but entirely luck, not judgment. It okay. wasn't it wasn't a trend that I spotted and thought, aha, yes, I no. must I must fly with this trend. It was very much just a yeah. case of I want to drink good alcohol free beer, but I can't. Let's see if we can make some. So I like to think that we played a small part in pushing that that trend forward but yeah we the, the timing was very fortuitous on our part definitely it was purely luck there was not like a, a big market research thing that did that you, you did this is what i'm gonna do or because there's quite a shift to go from from law to to food and drinks well i just think if, as long as you're having fun it doesn't really matter what you right. do so it was, it was fun in the law for a while and this is fun now so that's you know i think you just gotta make sure that you're having fun but i did spend some time looking at as, as much market research as I could find in terms of how much alcohol-free beer was actually being sold. And and the surprising thing was that it was still selling. I, I think it probably wasn't very good. Even 10 years ago, it was absolutely awful, but there was still a market for it. And so when I'm sat down with my wife and our newborn son and our new mortgage and my high-flying city law job, and I'm trying to convince her that I should sack it all off to go and open the world's first (laughs) alcohol-free craft brewery. What I said to her was, we're not trying to create a new sector. We're not trying to create a new type of drink. This has always existed. There's always been alcohol-free beer, and actually sales of alcohol-free beer are multi-multi-millions, and that's just in the UK. If you then extrapolate it out into Europe, it's actually a very, very significant market. And, and, And my pitch to my wife, of course, the most important person, was we only need to get a small section, a small amount of the total market volume that already exists for it to be capable of standing on its own two legs. But the potential is exponential, which I think we've shown. Just to give the, the listeners an idea about, do you know how big the market is like compared to the traditional beer market? It varies from country to country. Yeah. So in, in the UK, volumes of, of alcohol-free beer, I think is something like 1% of total volume, but, yeah. but it is increasing significantly. If you look at a country like Spain, actually the volume there is, I think, about 15 to 20%. Wow. And it was largely government-driven, so I understand that the government invested heavily in promoting alcohol-free beer as a genuine option. And, and if you go into a lot of bars and restaurants in Spain, they will have their, whether it's San Miguel or Mau or, or whatever it is, but they'll have the alcoholic version on draft. And then next to that, they will very often and have the alcohol-free version. Germany has been putting out very good alcohol-free wheat beers for a very long time. And Germany has a a brewing tradition that's quite still fragmented. It hasn't been consolidated by the big players. So it's still the sort of situation where most large towns will have their own local brewery. But that brewery will almost invariably put out an alcohol-free version of of their beer. It varies by country, really. Yeah, I can even remember when I uh, started my career back in McDonald's in Denmark. We had mm. alcohol for your beer in the fridge when right. we started out. It was then removed from, they said, I didn't think they sold much, but it was interesting. Mm. We had alcohol for beer and actually it sold quite well on a Sunday. But again, that's again, I know they have it in Sweden as well. And I know Austria is also where there's an alcohol free McDonald's. So even, and I think they're looking at what, how can they actually take that in? in some of their countries as well. I think it's a really interesting opportunity for alcohol-free beer. As I always like to say, there's there's no situation where it's inappropriate to drink an alcohol-free beer. You, you wouldn't drink an alcoholic beer if you were at a kid's birthday party looking after your children and you've got to then get back into your car and drive home. No. But actually, having a big drop, perfectly acceptable. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that at all. And so there's a lot of routes to market and, and retail outlets that we can tap into that a traditional beer, an alcoholic beer, wouldn't be able to. For example, we're sold in Holland and Barrett, the health food chain, and there's no way. Well, I say there's no way. I don't work for Holland and Barrett, but I am assuming that it's highly unlikely that Holland and Barrett will start selling alcoholic beer anytime soon. But alcohol-free drinks, we we can we can tap into that. Is there also something about the trend around you know health, well-being? You know that mm. new generation are very aware about what they put in their body and you know alcohol and what it does to to the body. And yeah, I think there's a sort of a, a global, certainly a Western world, overarching trend of as you say, well and well-being and there's all sorts of different things that plug into that but absolutely I think people are becoming more aware of the fact that 
and and I say this as a, as a person who now very much enjoys a glass of red wine with his Sunday dinner and an alcoholic beer, but people are becoming more and more aware of the fact that alcohol isn't necessarily good for you. But that doesn't mean, especially in the UK, where we have such a, a, a great tradition of going to the pub, that people don't want to go to the pub and socialise and talk and drink beer. But I think as more and more people become aware of the fact it's not necessarily good for you, then that it, it becomes a... I don't know if a self-fulfilling prophecy is the right phrase, but it certainly helps. Where where are you distributing this? I guess you are. You, you already meant in retail. Are you in any pubs and stuff like that? Because I think it's still difficult if you go into a pub always to find a good low alcohol or non alcohol full beer. Because I have meetings as well sometimes, and yeah. I will not like to have alcohol in the afternoon because I'm going home to my family as well. Absolutely. Yeah. The off trade listings that we've got are reasonably significant. So yeah. Tesco's, Morrison's, Booth's, Cicado. Holland and Barrett. I was surprised three years ago how difficult it was to convince the on-trade to even consider Big Drop at all because they just didn't see the need to do anything more than they were doing at that point in time. So they had the mass-produced, not very nice, alcohol-free lager in the fridge. And when I said to them, yeah, but look, you know, I've made this pale ale or I've made this stout and it's good, it tastes good. They're like, yeah, but nobody really wants it. But it was the supermarkets who actually kind of led the charge and were more willing to experiment, which I, with my non-existent knowledge of, of the industry, I thought was surprising. But... I think the on-trade, the pubs are now catching up to this and they realise that it's not good enough just to have that offering. You've got more and more people drinking less and less, looking for good quality options and people know now, informed consumers know that there are options out there. And so if the pubs aren't offering them, then they want to know why they're not offering them. And the same goes for restaurants, the same goes for casual dining. It's not enough to have that one option at the bottom of the menu being ignored. People want to have a number of options when they're when they're going out and socializing in pubs and eating in, in restaurants we're having one here in front of us and we we're testing it's a very nice pale ale drinking the pale ale yeah. absolutely i said when i saw it, i said i think i tried your beers but i'm not sure and then i saw the the bottle and said yes i tried it over christmas mm. and it and it didn't was no different because i didn't grasp at that point it was a low alcohol beer there we go i just thought oh that looks i buy from how it looks because i'm not like yeah i don't yeah. know much about it but i like the taste and i, yeah. I love pale ale so i'm gonna yeah. take one of those and this is one of my overriding goals uh. when I started was to produce a range of different beers. A, there was the fact that what was on offer wasn't very good, but B, I'm not really a lager drinker. I don't I drink lager in the summer every now and again if it's particularly hot, but generally oh. speaking, I will drink a darker beer, so a stout or an ale, or I'll drink a pale ale. And we wanted to be able to provide that range. So we are able to go, going back to your point about the on-trade and pubs and restaurants, we can go to them and say, look, you know, not everybody wants to drink this bland lager. We've got these flavorful options that you can offer as well as these ones yep. by all means offer that if you want to but we can give you an alternative you're going on draft beer you mentioned before the interview as well like that's that's the next mm. thing and i think i guess that becomes then even more relevant for for pubs the pubs now i think understand mm. that they have to offer more yep. choice but i think as soon as it becomes if not the norm then certainly a genuine opportunity and option for pubs to put alcohol-free beer on draft then that it removes i think some of the social stigma that does still exist around it because people don't want to go into the pub and have to look for what option there is in the fridge or if they can't see something say to the bar person i'm sorry because we're english we'll always apologize Mm -hmm. first obviously i'm very sorry but have you got any alcohol-free beer and then the bar person says yes actually i've got this thing here in the fridge would you like to try it whereas I think if it's front and centre, on the bar, on tap, my vision, my goal is is that three people, four people go into a pub and somebody says, I'll have a pint of Guinness and the other person has a pint of Stella. The other person has a gin and tonic and they say, well, what do you want, Michael? Oh, I'll have a pint of Big Drop. No problem. Okay, can I get a pint of Big Drop, please? And as soon as you've done that, I think you've, you've almost completely removed any stigma. You've normalised it. And then the four yeah. of us sit down and we enjoy our drinks and that's it. Yeah. And nobody's queried the fact that you've actually drunk an alcohol-free beer. You've just had a pint of beer. And I think, again, for, for pubs and dining groups, having that option, the way that I always try and sell it to the, the pub trade is to say you're not just catering for that one person in that group of four who's not drinking. And I always tell the story. Is, so every Easter, every Easter Saturday, me and 
a group of my friends go for a curry. And we've done this for 20 years, over 20 years, every Easter Saturday. Sometimes there's six of us, sometimes there's 25 of us. It depends where, where people are. We all go for a curry. And last last year, I think, yes, last year, there was about 12 of us and I wasn't drinking that night. I've got three kids now and I had the kids the next day and I knew I was going to have an early morning. So I was like, I'm just not going to drink. And the, the restaurant didn't have a very good alcohol-free beer, but I sort of sipped it. And then we finished and everybody said, oh, should we get, let's get some more beers. And I said, no, I don't, I, no, I don't want to get more beers. Can we, can we go to the pub now? And everyone was like, yeah, okay, fine. Let's go to the pub. Immediately that restaurant has just lost another round of 12 drinks because I'm saying I don't want to stay. Nobody else is bothered about staying. They just want some more beer. But I'm the driver or I'm the driver of where people are going. And they then said, oh, okay, well, where should we go? And on this particular street in Ipswich, there's a pub at the top of the road and there's a pub at the bottom of the road. And because obviously I look in everybody's fridge and I know exactly what alcohol-free beer they've got. The pub at the top of the road sells the mass-produced, not very nice lager. And the pub at the bottom of the road sells about four different alcohol-free beers including Big Drop. So I say, let's go there. And everyone says, okay, that's fine. So off we go and we all go into that pub and we all sit there and we buy about three rounds of drinks. That pub has got 36 drinks out of the fact that I'm not drinking. Suddenly the decision maker in choosing your pub has yeah. totally changed. Exactly, exactly. And if you have a situation whereby in a town such as Ipswich, where I live, there are a number of different pubs in, in the town. And if you're out and about, it's four, five, six of you and one of you is not drinking. But ultimately, the beer selection and the ambiance is largely the same in a number of different pubs. Then you're going to look for the differentiator. Yeah. And if the differentiator is the alcohol free options, then actually that's what's going to drive people to come through your door. When instead of look at the bottle here, I can see as well you won some awards and behind me as well, I saw when I came in there's some awards as well so you're doing a very nice beer from our point of view but there's also other people that are actually giving it awards as well i am always proud to say we've done very well in the brewing awards around the world what we are particularly proud of is the fact that we 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 win consistently not only awards in the low alcohol categories but in full strength categories as well so the stout the first beer that we released my baby my big drop baby won a silver in the world beer awards against full strength stouts this is the one we have here and table as so well this is the this one here yeah. that's the stout so that is the the silver there it also won my business partner was in stockholm the stockholm beer and whiskey festival which is a very large european drinks festival and he phoned me up and he said oh good news we've we've won gold in the the low alcohol category and i said wow okay that's you know i'm i'm happy with that but yeah. okay good he said but You'll never guess what. We've also won best beer in show. So out of 400 beers in the entire festival, most of which were alcoholic, the alcohol-free stout was declared the best. Wow, that's interesting. Saying, yes, that's better. This, Yes, yeah. that's a better award. Keep those yeah. ones coming. Yes. Yeah. So that's super interesting. In, and also, I guess, that's a crowd where they know what they're talking about. That's there. Absolutely, that's yeah. The... Those, were, those were the professional judges that were yeah. walking around and trying all of the different beers and marking them. And, and at the end of it, that was the one that came out on top. What is the, the journey then? Because uh, you're growing rapidly. Yep. And uh, what is the ambition? The ambition, genuinely, I would say, is to create the world's best alcohol-free beer brand. Mm -hmm. We started selling into Europe quite early on. So mm -hmm. we have good distribution in Scandinavia and the Netherlands, yep. as well as various other European countries. We've gone into Canada, into Ontario, and hopefully, fingers crossed, Australia soon. And this year, we'll, we'll see us starting to to explore opportunities in the US as well. The US with beer often has been the the trendsetter. The UK really followed the US in terms mm. of the craft beer yeah, the revolution. Craft bar scene. Brands like Sierra Nevada and Anchor Steam were really the ones leading the way in in craft beer. If you look at the US what you see is what we were seeing in the what I think I was seeing in the UK 3 or 4 years ago which is it exists. There are they call it non-alcoholic rather yeah. than alcohol free, but there are non-alcoholic beers available, yeah. but they're not very nice people actively say no they taste terrible same principle applies people drink them so if we can go and say well don't don't drink the not very nice one why don't yeah. you drink the nice one and then if you can also convert some people who actually are craft beer aficionados who enjoy beer who like drinking beer but either you know like me how old am i 41 busy job obviously young children getting to that age where all of a sudden you have to start thinking about staying or trying to keep vaguely fit but you still want a beer and, and I think it translates quite well across the Atlantic. So that's 
next steps, yeah. And it's super interesting is if you look at like, just take food as a comparison, I was sitting and thinking as you've been talking about things, it's a bit like the whole plant-based thing where you go yeah. with the meat. Yeah. Where, you know, before, if you wanted a plant-based meal, it could be quite poor. And now it's actually upping and sometimes it's actually better Yes. In some restaurants. Yes, from a restaurant perspective, I think exactly the same situation applies in terms of it's not just about catering for the vegan in a group of four or five. If you have a group of four or five people, two or three of them might even be vegan, you know, yeah. but, but they are the ones who are going to say, no, I don't want to go there because the vegan options aren't very good. You can get your burger or your steak or your fish and chips or whatever it is you want. You can get that anywhere, but... I'm going to push the group in a particular direction yeah. and I'm going to push it to the, the outlet that's providing me with the best plant-based options. That applies just as much to, to veganism as it does to, to alcohol-free beer. Yeah, and again, there was a lot of stigma around plant-based food or vegan Absolutely. food yeah. uh, where yeah. you know, it's starting to you know, it's, it's, it's a fact that it's better for you and the planet. Yeah. When you I, Absolutely. What about then when you grow like this? Is that going to be you that go in yourself into these markets or are you going to work together with partners or JVs or distribution? I think it depends on the country. Yeah. In Europe, we've got really good partnerships with distributors that are helping us to grow the brand. I was going to say as and when, if, if we do enter into Australia... If it probably would make more sense to have some kind of licensing arrangement because it's so far away. The conversations that we've had and the deals that we've we've done with Australia, it's it's just hard work yeah. to, to try and make it work. Uh, so a licensing model makes more sense. And I think in the US, there's any number of different ways that you can slice the cake to make it work. And, and we're, we're looking at those options now. Would you brew the uh, the beer in the UK? Or and then when you say licensing, that means that it will be brewed on a, a contract in yeah, Australia? So I deliberately took the decision when I started the business not to build a brewery for Big Drop because A, I didn't have the money to do it in the first place, which is always a very good reason not to do something. But B, I took the view that either I was going to fail quickly in which case it would be a bad idea to have a brewery that I then needed to try and get rid of. But also I, I was of the view that we would either fail quickly or it would succeed significantly, which we're not there yet, but we're on our way. But any brewery that I would have built three years ago would have been redundant four times over by now, just in terms of how much beer we need. So because of that, we contract brew. So we, we partner with breweries and they brew our beer for us. But that means that we've been able to expand, not pain-free, but certainly with less pain than if we were trying to expand our own brewery. But what it does also mean is that for markets such as Australia, as you say, we can brew it locally. And we will start brewing in Canada in the next couple of months to service the, the market in Canada and it's never made sense to me I find this quite interesting craft brewers talk about provenance a lot it's one of the things that some people say yeah. makes a craft beer a craft beer that you can identify where it is made but I've always been of the view that that's fine and that might be the USP for some breweries but I don't see it as being determinative of what makes a craft beer a craft beer and if we can make our beer in Canada and people want to drink it in Canada then frankly that saves us shipping it across the Atlantic which yeah. isn't good for the environment and it's not good for the bottom line. So it makes no sense at all to me to ship beer around the world if we can brew it locally. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's again, you know, interesting to, in a way, from an environmental point of view, mm -hmm. all the things we're sending across the, the globe and back and forward, fish yeah. or whatever it is, honey, I think yeah. like that, 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 that there will come a, a break with that because, first of all, it would not be affordable to do. Yep. Because, you know, wealth goes up in all countries and, and it doesn't make it a better product if you, you have no. the right setup. Absolutely. And, there's, and there's, I think there's already talks about that in the coffee world where, uh, right, you know, okay. where you should actually roast the beans locally and not yeah. send them across the world to yeah. be roasted. That makes perfect sense to me. I, I, I think provenance is important. You do need to know where things come from. I, yeah. I like to think I pay attention to where my food comes from and where my yeah. drink comes from. But if I can partner with a, a reputable brewery in Canada that can identify the source of its ingredients, it makes perfect sense. So the ingredients is there anything special about that is that coming from a special place is that there's a couple of things that makes our beer special there's a number of different ways that you can make alcohol-free beer and what most 
people did until Johnny came up with Johnny our brewer came up with his his process was that they brewed an alcoholic beer and then they removed the alcohol afterwards mm. and you essentially remove it either by heating the beer because alcohol evaporates at a lower temperature than water so the yeah. alcohol evaporates first or you filter it it's called reverse osmosis is the technique it's a bit like kidney dialysis so mm. you, when you clean blood yeah. you you keep what you want on one side and then you push it through a filter and you get the stuff you don't want on the other side yeah. and you can do that with beer the problem for us was that we wanted to make lots and lots of different styles of beer not just lager So again, those two methods, you can make them work for lager because lager doesn't fundamentally, most lager doesn't taste very much. And that's a positive. That's why people like lager. It's clean, crisp, bitter, refreshing. So you can filter the alcohol out without losing other flavours. But as soon as you start making, like we do, pale ales and stouts and and beers with lots of other flavours, big flavours, if you mess with it, if you filter it, if you heat it, you lose those flavours and aromas. So our beer is just brewed normally. It's fundamentally, it is just brewed to strength, as they say. So it never gets higher than 0.5% alcohol by volume. But in order to have big flavours, in order to have big aromas, from an ingredients perspective, we use many, many different types of grain in our recipes. So if you were producing a standard, in air quotes, standard 4% pale ale, you might only use one or two types of grain but across our core range of four beers we've got pale ale and an ipa a snout and a lager we're using something between 20 and 25 different styles of grain in those beers so we're getting lots of different flavors from those grains going international you told me a bit about you changed the design yet and we have the the old some of the old design here but also the new design that's yeah. a bit more it's more different it's more loud i would say the new design in, in a positive way yeah it's it's bright and bold yeah. and the artwork on the old bottles was of suffolk landscapes which is where i'm from but again as i say because we don't particularly want or need to talk about provenance we talk about the ABV, the fact that it's alcohol-free, that's what we talk about. And so these new designs, I think, sort of highlight the bold nature of the beer, highlight the flavours, but also allow the brand the ability to go international quite easily. Just touching on you, we talked a bit about low alcohol, non-alcohol. So there's 0.5 in here. I know that there's no alcohol in principle. You would find those traces in normally yes. in other foods. Yes, and stuff like. absolutely. So just to, to clarify that to the listeners, when, when, when are you non-alcoholic the answer is it's a good lawyer answer yeah it depends depends which country you sell it in yeah so in australia for example we're not able to call this alcohol free so in australia you have to be 0.00 no alcohol at all in the us 0.5 is non-alcoholic but you're not allowed to call it alcohol free in canada it's 0.4 in the uk it used to be the case that alcohol free was 0.05 but the legislation actually fell away that underpinned that and so we now call our beer alcohol free and the same in europe 0.5 is alcohol free as you say though broadly the same sort of alcohol content you might find in orange juice got 0.2 0.3 bananas become slightly alcoholic yeah. quite quickly when they become overripe yeah. you would expect to find probably 0.5 percent alcohol in a in a brown banana so it's very much a trace trace amount of alcohol to go out and and do all this i i know that because where we 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 met our way so where you met my uh, friend and partner john mm. was at a launch as part of a crowdfunding so you are right yeah. now looking to scale the business and also getting the, the the public involved in this absolutely the crowdfunding round is live on cedars one of the big crowdfunding platforms we're looking to raise something between 500 and 750,000 and absolutely it's it's an opportunity for not just professional or semi-professional investors to take the opportunity but also people who enjoy drinking big drop who like the brand and who think it's it's got a good future i think you can buy a stake in big drop for as little as 13 pounds off the top of my head so yeah it, it's an opportunity to to bring our our customers our consumers and our fans sort of on board and, and with us on the journey and that's open now so if people want to go then go on cedars and it's open now so yeah. you just google cedars you'll be able to find us there and that's part of the the money that's going to be used for expanding globally i guess 
Yes, yeah. it's it's about setting up those those brewing partnerships overseas oh. and and then funding marketing to make people aware of it. So for people out there that don't know how a, a brewing business will work with your company, you don't run the brewery. What does that mean from a, a people point of view? Because always when you scale businesses, that's mm. challenging and a great part of it as well when you get it right. So, Absolutely, yeah. we've we've invested already quite heavily in putting together a great team. To, to help us build the brand in the UK. And, and we have marketing people and sales people and operations people now that make sure that everything is done properly and, and are out there shouting about the brand. Even in the UK, as we continue to grow in the UK, I think if money were no object, then of course you would have as all the people in the world selling yeah. the beer. But there is space still for, for some sales people to, to go out around the UK. We're quite London biased. We do have people in the north. We've got good distribution in Bristol, for example. So we, someone over there to help us grow and expand it in the UK. But the team that we've got at the moment, I think, is is pretty fantastic. The scaling a, a business from, I guess, it started with, with two people mm-hmm. and then to where you are now. Mm-hmm. How has that been compared to, I guess, the lawyer company, you, you scaled that as well. But how, 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 how different has that been? Because, you know, scaling is always, you know, growing a business is, yeah. the, is the hardest part to get to a certain stage yeah. where you yeah. start to get other people on board to help you because as the founders, you do literally everything. Well, my business partner was very much, I, I wanted him to, to join me because he is the social media web design guru. That's not me, but everything else I was doing. And unfortunately, of course, making up as I went along because I had absolutely no idea what I was doing in the yeah. first year. But I was always of the view that it was really important to get people on board as quickly as possible who, who did have experience of the industry who knew what they were doing and and could take it to the next level i'm always learning from mistakes everybody always makes mistakes but having people who could just avoid those pitfalls and minefields that otherwise i would have wandered blithely into if you uh, look at where you are now and where you're going to be in five years time if Mm -hmm. we sat down and have the same conversation what do you think Mm -hmm. does happen in those five years in five years time i would very much hope to be the number one craft option in the UK. I would want to be on hundreds if not thousands of draft lines in the UK. Significant on-trade presence in our Scandinavian Dutch countries and to have some significant presence in the US and Australia and Canada as well. And I think I think we can do that. The, you talked a lot about Scandinavia and Holland a couple of times. Mm. Is, is that a key market as well as the UK because of the, 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 the trends? Sweden was the country that actually mm. got me to quit my day job. So I was still working as a lawyer for the first sort of six or seven months of big job. But then an importer in Sweden picked up the phone and said, we'd like to start importing nine, ten pallets of beer a month versus the one or two pallets of beer that I was selling at the time. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. No problem. (laughs) Let me just go away and make that happen. That's fine. But again, they get it in Scandinavia and the Netherlands, but particularly Scandinavia, alcohol-free beer, even less less of a stigma than in the UK. Yeah. You don't have that sort of educational piece that you're trying to get across to people that it's okay to drink alcohol-free beer. It's not a problem. In fact, it's a plus and it will help your businesses. They get it in Scandinavia. Yeah, it's been really good to us actually. Yeah. I think it comes with, again, we talked about plant-based food before, so I'm from Scandinavia. So mm. and, and, I, and I know that that's really taking a quicker route there than yeah. any other place in the world. I think I think that's yeah, right. It's it's, it's it, it, you know it's a great place to do business. It's easy yeah. to do business. People get the trends. They see the trends. As you say, in some instances, they are setting the trends. And so I, I think we will continue. I hope to do very well in those markets. Who are your heroes? Where do you get inspirations? when the times get tough as they do sometimes i don't know honestly if i would say that i've got any heroes Mm. i think that might be stretching it a little bit my business partner in the law firm i think is a very good example of somebody who sets a goal and then achieves it regardless and i think that's always something i bear in the back of my mind that uh, he's very very focused very focused and that is that's inspiring sometimes and then also very cheesy But my dad, whilst not a businessman at all, he would freely admit that. He would hold his hands up and say he is not a businessman. I have never seen him 
lose his temper or raise his voice, no matter what the issue. I think I've learned from him. You rarely, if ever, achieve anything by throwing your toys out of the pram, as we say. Oh, yeah, that's what we tell our kids as well. So. That's what we tell our kids, yeah. Is there one thing we haven't talked about that you want people to know about? I think the most important thing is now it's about choice. For me, it was always about choice, giving people not just the choice of great alcoholic beer, but the choice of great alcohol-free beer. And that whether you're a supermarket or whether you're a pub or whether you're a restaurant, providing that choice is not just catering, as we've discussed, to, to the people who aren't drinking or to the vegans or whoever. It's about widening your audience and convincing more and more people to come and spend their hard-earned money with you. In the end of the podcast, we always ask the guests to give one advice to people that either want to go out and start their own business or want to do something that's a bit different what they do what would your one advice be to people out there that has a dream or want to start a business oh it's easy it is always better to regret something you've done something you haven't done oh. if you do it and it fails doesn't matter because you've done it that's very good advice <laughs> because you don't know <laughs> you don't know no it might fail it starts but with action it starts with action but do it and then keep going what did i see in a window of a shop the other day it said the easy bit is starting but the hard bit is carrying on your partner with the focus exactly yeah yeah what's the worst that can happen <laughs> yeah what's the worst that can happen so you already told where people can go and pick up a couple of the beers yeah so that that's out there and we're going to put a couple of links in the podcast as Brilliant. well Thank for people you. to to find out where they can find you about and also the uh, the crowdfunding link as well thank you very much for your time rob thank you and we will uh, continue sitting and drinking some beer enjoying here. some beer yeah crack it cheers cheers thank you rob for sharing your journey trends on low alcohol beer your good advice in growing in a startup and much more if you enjoyed today's podcast please give us a like share rate or subscribe to one of our channels thanks to let's talk video production for your support on the podcast a massive thank you to experience 101 for supporting us getting this out to more movers shakers and mavericks and if you have not yet signed up to the event do the right thing on the 18th of march in london get on to experience 101.live slash events and get your ticket today tune in next time for another industry interview and in the meantime Find out more about us and subscribe to our newsletter at hospitalitymavericks.com. Thanks for listening and be maverick.